Okay, so so let me start. So, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this next gen um, webinar. We are very excited um, about hearing you know different perspectives on the topic of airline industries. Um, and thank you very much to uh, Luke, Kat, John, and um, also um, Christian and um, Adam for for taking part in the seminar, and also to Evan Zucker, you know, who's who's driving this forward. Um, Triple I um, is very delighted that the next gen program is keeping um, this webinar series alive over the course of the last um, few months and we're looking forward to really get engaged and um, you know some more next gens but also triple i member into this webinar series so if you have you know any um topic that you would like to share um your <coughs> perspectives um you know judicial um changes that happen in jurisdictions and um, please let us know and again thank you very much to everyone who gets involved and i'm giving over to adam thank you Thank you, Annika. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located. Uh, my name is Adam Crane, and I'm a senior associate uh, in the Insolvency and Dispute Resolution Group uh, with HSM Chambers in the Cayman Islands. I will be moderating uh, this exceptional group of panelists today. Um, thank you all for attending, and uh, special thanks to the International Insolvency Institute for hosting this extremely interesting presentation on the key issues in cross-border aviation insolvencies. Uh, there are too many issues to, or too many topics to uh, cover within this one hour time slot. So our panelists will focus their attention today on the impact of COVID-19 on the airline industry, the benefits of filing in certain jurisdictions, and the major challenges faced from a creditor and customer uh, perspective. Stay tuned for a potential round two, uh, hopefully in August or September. Uh, today, um, as Annika had said, you'll be hearing from John Middleton, Christian Hilpert, uh, Kat Burke, and Luke Barefoot. Uh, John Middleton is the, uh, an assistant general counsel for the International Air Transport Association based out of Geneva and has been involved in a number of airline insolvencies. Christian Hilpert is a partner with Evershed Sutherland in Germany and has worked on a number of uh, airline insolvencies insolvencies, including the Air Berlin map. Uh, Kat Burke is based in London and is an associate in Scadden's corporate restructuring group. She is qualified in England, New York, and California, and has worked on uh, various uh, airline insolvency proceedings, including the American Airlines Chapter 11 proceeding and the Swiss port scheme. And finally, uh, last but not least, uh, we have Luke Barefoot, who is a partner with Cleary Gottlieb in uh, New York and is currently working on some of the uh, recent uh, Latin American airline insolvencies uh, that have filed uh, Chapter 11 proceedings. And just one uh, housekeeping point, if, you, if any of the attendees have any questions for the panelists, we ask that you please use the Q&A portion. Uh, it should be at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this will be a very interactive presentation, so the questions will likely not be answered throughout the presentation, but we have a Q&A portion at the end, and our panelists will do their best to answer your questions at that point. And without further ado, I'm happy to turn this uh, discussion over to John, who will begin the discussion on a slightly depressing note, but hopefully give you some uplifting comments uh, by outlining uh, the grim financial circumstances faced uh, by the airline industry as a result of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, hopefully my screen is being shared and you can see the presentation. So I'd like to just walk through a very quick presentation on the, on the state of the industry. Um, given our time constraints, I want to move pretty quickly and so I won't hover on any one particular slide, uh, but would say that these are all uh, from publications that are available on our website, www.iata.org. Uh, so you can certainly go through and read more about them there, or I, I believe we're recording this as well. So of course you can go back and hit pause on any particular slide. So not to bury the lead, but this is the worst financial year in the history of aviation, uh, full stop. Uh, so you've got a chart on, on the right that shows some of the data, uh, but in general, we've got over a 50% decrease in spend, fares, rates, departures, basically all the critical metrics uh, that we're concerned about. We've got a revenue decrease uh, anticipated of over US dollars 400 billion with a B and a net loss of US dollars 84 billion. Absolutely huge numbers, obviously. Um, 
Do we expect that this is going to be the case going forward into 2021? Unfortunately, to some degree, yes. Uh, thankfully, probably not as bad, although obviously these these forecasts change almost on a daily basis. Uh, we're starting to see some more either resurgences or second waves, depending on how you want to label it. And so we certainly hope that this does not uh, decrease or worsen uh, in the next few months. But so you see here the, the projected 80 four plus this year and we expect that it will improve but still be negative uh, 15 or so billion for 2021. Um, so what we've got going on right now obviously uh, uh, through IATA, through ICAO, through the airlines is a lot of work on the restart um, and I can commend you, uh, that's a whole nother topic, but, but I can commend you to the work of the ICAO CART, which is the Council on Aviation uh, Restart Task Force. If this is something you're particularly interested in, there's a lot of work being done there. But even with all of that work and, and the hopeful uh, restart that we're going to see soon, that doesn't necessarily mean that carriers are going to immediately be out of the woods. And in fact, when you start operating, things may actually get worse because obviously you've got a lot of the operating costs that you don't have when you, the airline is shut down. Uh, what we're showing is that there are very, very few airlines shown here in green uh, that can be profitable under 62% load factor. Uh, and so if you have things like uh, social distancing on planes where you've got a middle seat that's required to be empty, uh, which we're still arguing with some of the regulators about in some jurisdictions, you can see that no matter what you do, <laughs> you're already you're already in the in the red. So what does this mean, you know, from a financial standpoint, from a restructuring standpoint? Well, we've seen a huge cash burn uh, in in 2020, 61 billion over there, the big ugly red bar on the far right. Uh, and as everyone knows, cash is king. And with with the refunds and everything else that has been putting pressure on that, that that's really hurting the bottom line right now. Uh, on the flip side, debt is rising uh, quite a lot. You've got, obviously part of the y-axis is missing there, but you've still got an increase of four, from 430 to 550 uh, US billion in debt from the end of 2019 to the end of 2020. And so when you compare that to net debt over EBITDA, you're looking at you know a pretty consistent run from 2013 of 20 to 2019 of around five, jumping up to three times that uh, over three times that to 16 times in 2021. Uh, so I, you know, very grim news, I think, on the one hand, uh, for the state of the industry and something that we're, we're very concerned about. Uh, what I do want to end on a, on a somewhat more positive note, however, is that, of course, airlines, just like other businesses, uh, can benefit from the bankruptcy restructuring processes, where we've seen, I think, uh, between 20 to 30 airlines already that have filed for these types of processes in uh, 2020. And I'm, I hope there aren't more, but I can suspect that there absolutely will be given the numbers uh, that I've just shown you. Uh, and this is all over the globe. Obviously we've had quite a few uh, in the US, but we've seen filings in Australia and Thailand and South Africa, Mauritius, Ireland, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not uh, you know, located in any one particular area. Uh, in general, uh, IATA is, is very supportive of the ability uh, for airlines to have uh, this sort of protection uh, and the breathing space to be able to, to restructure and, and hopefully recover. Uh, and this is going to be vital to the planned and, and hope for restart that we're going to be seeing slowly into 2021, but then hopefully picking up more into 2022 and, and beyond. So that's, that's ultimately kind of hopefully setting the stage with a little more positive end note that as bad as things are from a financial side, what we want to kind of focus on here are what are the options uh, under the restructuring provisions, under the, the various uh, schemes that we have around the world that can help us get through this uh, and hopefully sort of weather the storm uh, to get us to a, a safer place from a financial situation in, in 2022 and beyond. Thank you, John. Uh, it seems to me that uh, it's important uh, for airlines to continue to operate and fly uh, whilst uh, undergoing restructuring. Uh, I'm wondering uh, if the panelists can uh, discuss how that works in their own jurisdiction. And I'll turn it over to Luke first. Sure. So, so in the U.S., um, there are uh, putting aside the numerous 
kind of uh, border closures and travel restrictions, uh, airlines are, uh, are, are free to operate either, either in a proceeding or out of a proceeding. Um, in the U.S., it's, it's typical that even if you file a, a restructuring proceeding under Chapter 11, you can continue to operate in the ordinary course. And uh, that's what we've seen with the uh, Latin American carriers that have recently filed in, in the U.S. Um, there, there's obviously uh, greatly, greatly reduced uh, demand and therefore very, very limited schedules. And as John alluded to, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of empty seats, but they're, they're not uh, blanket prohibitions, at least domestically, on, on actually flying. Thanks, Luke. And how about, uh, Kat, how does it work in the UK? Right, so in England, it used to be that you would have most likely needed to file for administration for the majority of these cases. And it's rare, but not impossible to fly in administration. Um, the most recent case of an airline flying in administration was Paramount in 1989. But now, uh, as many of you will have seen in the last couple of days, Virgin Atlantic has filed for the new super scheme under Part 26A of the Corporate Insolvency and Govern Governance Act that was just put into place. Um, the super scheme could take up an entire session, so I'm not gonna go into very much detail, except to say that the, uh, the, act, has been, the act became effective about two and a half weeks ago. Um, you can fly during a scheme, and now that there is a cross-class cram down mechanism, uh, enshrined in the super scheme, it makes it a realistic option for financial restructurings of airlines. The other interesting aspect of the super scheme is that in the initial draft of the legislation, there was an exclusion for airline related interest and that exclusion was removed before the bill became effective. Um, most likely due to lobbying from airlines uh, that threatened to go to the US to file a chapter 11 or other overseas restructurings. That said, uh, there will be some interesting issues to grapple with on the interaction between the Cape Town Convention and the restructuring plan. The UK has adopted the Cape Town Convention and the question is whether the super scheme is an insolvency proceeding. So the English approach seems to be, and there's no surprise here, that you can have your cake and eat it too. Uh, it's not technically an insolvency proceeding, for uh, I think purposes of the Cape Town Convention, but um, it might be an insolvency proceeding for purposes of getting chapter 15 recognition. Um, I should mention that there are differences of opinion here and uh, I would expect to see this issue on the Cape Town Convention come up in Virgin. So watch this space. Thanks Kat. And Christian, uh, can airlines fly in Germany? Yes, they can. Um, it's um, so we don't have a special proceeding here in Germany, uh, which covers airlines. I mean, I'm I'm absolutely pleased to hear that the UK seems to go into that direction and keeps them in the air, which hasn't been the case in Germany. Traditionally, it'll depend on your cash flow. So if you structure the proceeding properly, um, the airline will typically file for what we call a creditor protection scheme or a debtor in possession. Um, and that will allow them to, to structure that and to maintain the course of business. Um, there is uh, probably a very important point to make, which is on the creditor side. So normally in other jurisdictions where, where airlines can't fly, this is uh, because uh, them, that might be regarded as being detrimental to the creditors or the creditor majority because they're using the cash. That's not the situation in Germany. So in Germany, the proceeding will be aiming at continuing it, continuing flying, and that will of course include also continuing um, transportation, continuing selling tickets. Um, however, it's it's not uh, it's not a given thing. Um, I would I would like to t try to touch on one point, which is the airline slots in that regard, which of course are are the most important asset of each and every airline. Uh, we'll cover that off in more detail in the in the next session, hopefully. Um, but uh, one of the crucial things is to maintain this golden asset. Uh, you need uh, to follow the so-called 80-20 rule. So 80% of the slots need to be used, which of course in an in an insolvency proceeding uh, is a very cash-intensive question uh, and and a decision to take, especially as sales will go down at the same time and people will will uh, stop buying your tickets. So. Uh, 
that's a bit of the conflict we're traditionally seeing here when, when airlines continue. But normally you would take them into restructuring and German law does not prohibit that thing. Thank you, Christian. And uh, John, how does uh, this work in other jurisdictions or other notable jurisdictions? Uh, so I, I think generally the trend is that the bankruptcy filing itself does not restrict filing in most countries. Uh, the big outlier that we had forever uh, was the UK, <laughs> but we've all, our, our discussion on this has kind of been uh, changed a little bit with the, the Virgin announcement. Uh, we've now got a test case, I guess, um, and it, you know, we have every anticipation that that's going to go well and they'll be able to keep keep flying and that's that's very welcome in the UK. But, you know, around the world we've seen Romania, Italy, Australia, Thailand, Mauritius, South Africa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lots and lots of places uh, where the airlines can keep filing keep flying, uh, notwithstanding the filing, which is which is good. I think it is important to note, though, that it's not just the filing itself that might cause some issues, right? So um, in you've, you have all the, the normal operating requirements of maintaining your license, as Christian importantly said, keeping your slots, which that could be a, an entire presentation on it, of its own, slots in bankruptcy. Um, all, of the, all of these operating requirements, if your finances are in trouble, uh, or you have restrictions that are not just because of the per se filing, but because of restrictions in the case that may still impact your, your ability to file, uh, uh, to, sorry, to, to keep flying. Uh, so in general, you know, as I said in my opening comments, we, we as IATA really support the ability of the airlines to keep flying uh, in restructuring and actually um, engage in a lot of advocacy with the UK on this point during the airline uh, insolvency review. Uh, really, at the end of the day, when you've, you've got an airline that's uh, filed, you need to get these passengers home, uh, even if the airline's ultimate plan may be to wind up in the next months. And, you know, our, our opinion is that the, the person, the entity that is best placed to do that is the airline itself. Thank you, John. Um, Luke briefly touched uh, upon this. Um, we've seen a recent trend uh, with many Latin American carriers making Chapter 11 filings, including LATAM, Aeromexico, and Avianca. Luke, why would a company file in another jurisdiction rather than their home jurisdiction? Sure. So it, it's an interesting question. And just to step back for, for a second, you know, for uh, uh, folks that don't generally, uh, you know, do debtor side work uh, on a cross-border basis, it, it might seem kind of intuitive that if you have a, a German company that file in Germany or a U.S. company that file in the U.S. and, and really nowhere else. But um, it is uh, a really uh, interesting exercise to think about the comparable jurisdictions uh, and the rights and powers that you might have in those and the options to get those proceedings recognized in in other places where you may have important assets or or do business. Um, so um, in, uh, you know, in, in the US, we have seen uh, this trend where uh, a lot of uh, major Latin American airlines have have uh, availed themselves of the rights and powers they have under Chapter 11. Um, and, you know, the, uh, uh, some of the reasons for that are that uh, a lot of the Latin American countries, including Colombia and Chile, are, are signatories to the UNCTRAL model law. So there's the availability of recognition. Um, there's also, under the U.S. Code, a very, very minimal jurisdictional requirement. Generally, a, a retainer with your lawyer is enough to, to give, you, uh, to give the, the bankruptcy court jurisdiction over the, over the debtor. And then on the flip side, you know, the automatic stay uh, and the powers under the automatic stay apply under U.S. law extraterritorially all over the world, wherever the uh, wherever the debtor has assets. And there are very important, particularly with respect to to lease obligations, there are very um, debtor friendly benefits of rejection, uh, particularly with respect to airlines that are saddled with fleets. Uh, and leased planes that are that are far larger than they need, they have the ability to reject those planes and and classify the damages resulting from those rejections as prepetition obligations um, that can be compromised in bankruptcy. And Luke, what are some of the challenges with the, with those kinds of filings? I think the biggest challenge is uh, local creditors. Uh, you know, if you have a local landlord in uh, in your home jurisdiction or a sort of mom and pop supplier who uh, doesn't necessarily have 
uh, assets in the U.S. or ties for business in the U.S. that may be willing to flout a bankruptcy court's order. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in some jurisdictions, the recognition proceeding may not uh, cover uh, those obligations or in, in some countries, in Ecuador and Brazil, there, there are very limited recognition uh, options. So uh, uh, th that, that I think is, is the, the largest challenge, particularly um, I think with some categories of creditors like, like labor cl claimants or, or union claimants who, who do have um, particular public policy arguments they can make under many uh, local laws. Uh, but we do have a, a tool to deal with those in the U.S. in the form of a, uh, a foreign vendor and critical vendor program where you have the ability to pay limited amounts to them, often in exchange for them submitting to the U.S. court's jurisdiction. Thanks, Luke. Kat, I understand you're working on an interesting airline-associated case right now that could have filed in the U U.S. but has filed in the U.K. instead. Um, how did that uh, work and why do you think they took that approach? Right. So, while it's not an airline insolvency, um, it, it's Swissport, it's airline related baggage handling. And I should note that this is an ongoing case. And so there's only so much we can discuss here. Everything I'm about to say is public and is my own opinion and not the opinions of the firm. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, Swissport it recently completed a scheme of arrangement in the UK and sought recognition in the US under Chapter 15. Uh, this was interesting from my perspective because having practiced in the US for so long and now practicing here, the debt was all New York governed and there was New York choice of law provisions and lots of Chapter 11 provisions in the debt documents thinking and leading to a filing in the US. Um, it's, a, it's a global company. so. Um, it was really strange when they filed uh, a scheme in the in England to, um, and the scheme company was an English company that was a guarantor of the debt, uh, not an, an original obligor. Uh, the deed, a deed was entered into with the scheme company to create a ricochet claim to make the company an artificial obligor. And all of this was fully disclosed and agreed and um, argued to be necessary to allow for good forum shopping and access to the English court. The scheme was convened and sanctioned and recognized in the US, it's, it's all been done. And I should note that there were no official objections to the scheme and I think that was very important. So the English court seemed to be taking a page from the US in that the creditors know what's in their interest and if they don't complain, well, then why should the court come in and second guess that? Um, anyway, the scheme was accomplished to um, lower the thresholds under the documents to allow for super senior debt to be layered on. It didn't, it didn't actually, the scheme that was approved didn't actually affect any of the debt at, um, as a restructuring or putting any additional money in at the time. Um, what it did was it, it lowered the thresholds and it allowed for super senior debt to come in and, um, and it allowed for the governing law to be changed and choice of law provisions to take advantage of this, we think to take advantage of this new super scheme um, opportunity in, the, in England to, to allow for more fulsome restructuring. Now, a company that could easily have filed in the US chose to spend money on a process to give it the optionality to file in the UK. And that is what I think makes this case so interesting. So again, we have to watch this space and see what happens. Thanks, Kat. John, what other factors do airlines consider when uh, deciding where to file? Yeah. I, so sometimes you may not even have a choice, right? So if you've got um, government support, for example, that may encourage or even require you to file locally. Uh, we've seen some cases where uh, the, the local jurisdiction, the local legislature has even written legislation specifically for the restructure of a home-based carrier. Uh, Malaysian comes to, comes to mind after the, the two crashes there. Uh, so, you know, in some cases, it's, it's sort of almost taken out of your hands because of the nature of, of, of the law there. Uh, but, but some of the other things I think that can be considered when you do have a choice uh, is the order of priorities for creditors. Uh, obviously, uh, 
groups of creditors like employees uh, may have a greater or lesser priority depending on which jurisdiction you file in, uh, which can have a real big impact on your ability to restructure and come out the other side. Um, and and it, it still remains the case kind of as Luke has probably seen that the, the relative strength of the insolvency process and the familiarity of the courts with that process is, is really important, not just for the debtor, but also for the creditors. I mean, obviously if you're a, a local landlord, that's one thing and you probably don't want to see the airline filing abroad where you can't as easily access the courts. But uh, for you know the, the global finance parties, for, for IATA as a global creditor, we actually take some comfort if we see an airline that is, is filing in the US, in Germany, in one of these jurisdictions that has handled uh, airline restructuring successfully in the past, and a lot of the uh, sort of nuts and bolts arguments that you would you you might get into in a jurisdiction that hasn't handled one, that's already sort of been done and dusted. And you can, for example, in the U.S., you file a bunch of first days that address all of that. The court signs them no problem, and and we move on to address the the more unique issues of that particular carrier. Thanks, John. Uh, Christian, uh, what is the main difference to, uh, of filing in Germany compared to the U.K.? I think it was it was a lot bigger before the scoopers scheme, which the UK has now gone for, <laughs> <laughs> which is obviously now so 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 the UK is getting close because um, I would say the main difference was you could continue to fly, as in most European or uh, continental European jurisdictions. Um, uh, I think there are there are of course a couple of others, and and, and not um, I don't want to give a lecture here on German insolvency law, but uh, one. Um, one of the crucial pieces is, of course, especially for airlines, that um, they are used to their home jurisdiction. So you will rarely see that an airline comes into Germany um, uh, to file. I, I think forum shopping is still a bit suspicious here for uh, reasons that are good or bad. I'm not particularly a fan of the positions the German courts need to uh, tend to take here, but uh, they do it. Um, so, so uh, I think the question from a German perspective is more, uh, do airlines leave the country to go elsewhere to do it? And um, I think one of the main advantages of Germany is that they will all be calculating their governmental support. So that links into with what John said, well, you don't have an option. So um, uh, one of the main factors in the German insolvency law that is that if you can continue, you can get governmental support for your employees' wages uh, for up to three months which of course is a large factor and a large cash reserve you can build up during that that time at the same time having a moratorium in place. Um, and that's of course if you're used to the jurisdiction, if language is not your key issue, which of course uh, is a larger barrier than between English speaking countries, um, then, then uh, I think it would take a lot for a German airline to file abroad and it would probably be looked at as being a suspicious thing for them to do so so that might even not be too beneficial um i think the the final uh, thing or the final the largest difference is is and that's on the on the flip side of, of this is um that under german law you can't limit your insolvency to a certain group of creditors for example so um it's it's a pretty it's a pretty much black and white process you're either in or you're not and if you're in you need to handle all your debt all your creditors um, you get, um, uh, yeah, they will just, they will just need to be handled and dealt with. And you will also trigger all sorts of clawback rights, uh, continuing obligations and all that stuff, which in the UK typically uh, don't have, or are not of that importance as they are here. Thanks, Christian. Uh, you've brought up an interesting point uh, about uh, creditors and, and their involvement. Uh, let's, uh, uh, look at the dynamic of dealing with creditors and customers. And Kat, uh, um, in the UK and, and in other jurisdictions, you have this concept of wrongful trading uh, or the zone of insolvency as it's referred to in, in various other jurisdictions. How does that play into an airline insolvency? Right, so wrongful trading or operating in the zone of insolvency or whatever you call it in your jurisdiction is often a key consideration for directors and a driver on when you should file. And, it, and it, it could really put creditors in the driving seat 
Um, this is one of the primary reasons that airlines stopped flying in administrations because there was no duty for the airline to repatriate passengers, but um, they could they 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 could be held liable for um, for trading while they were insolvent, and um, the wrongful trading in the UK. Um, still could be an issue, but for now, it's been, it's been suspended until September. So it's not an issue right now. Um, the big issue is whether an airline can continue to maintain its licenses, which John mentioned earlier. Uh, the licenses would be revoked where the CAA is no longer satisfied that the operator could meet its financial obligations for a 12 month period. Uh, but there is an ability to grant a temporary license under 12 months if there's no safety risk or there is a realistic prospect of a satisfactory financial reconstruction in that period. Uh, if the super scheme is used for a solvent restructuring and there's a clear path to recovery, then perhaps this is less of a concern. Uh, creditor consent in the restructuring will be key here. So creditors haven't lost all of their um, control. <clears throat> and that's not to say you couldn't do it without full creditor consent, but you will want to show uh, the CAA that the plan will be implemented quickly and easily. And that's not easy to do when you don't have the majority of creditors on board. Thanks, Kat. Uh, Luke, what are some of the strategies that carriers have pursued uh, to deal with creditors? Sure. So uh, first, just to contrast a little bit with the experience that Kat described in the UK. In the US, there, there is no doctrine of, of wrongful trading or, you know, um, uh, you know I know sometimes in, in continental Europe, there are, there are criminal liabilities for directors and officers who continue to operate and, and trade uh, at a time when they become insolvent. Um, under the most states' laws in the U.S., uh, it's it's very much a, a black and white rule that uh, th there is no zone. It's, it's certainly true under Delaware law, which is uh, the most common state of incorporation. Uh, that uh, once you become insolvent, uh, you're you're free to continue to trade. It's just that the scope of uh, constituents that you owe duties to expands to include uh, creditors. So it's very much uh, less driven by um, the insolvency question and oftentimes more driven by the remedies that, that creditors can take. So particularly if you have secured creditors who are uh, potentially going to seize collateral, exercise set off rights, um, or um, you know, interfere, with your, interfere with your ability to continue to operate. That's usually much more the the driver behind the strategy and the the ability to file. Um, I think in in the U.S. there's there's been uh, and and I think elsewhere there's been a, a really interesting sort of dynamic in the in the airline industry in particular between um, the ability to negotiate accommodations either inside or outside of bankruptcy with financial creditors. Um, as opposed to uh, as opposed to, to industry creditors, because oftentimes you know industry creditors you have a, a mutually assured destruction if the airline no longer continues to operate, and they're very much dependent on and 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 would like to see the airline get back to its historic levels of of flying and purchasing fuel and purchasing parts and purchasing new aircraft, whereas you know financial creditors if you're a large uh, a bank or hedge fund, uh, you're not solely exposed to the industry and you might be fine to take a, um, to take a, uh, to take a, 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 a slightly larger recovery, even if it meant that the future operations were going to be diminished. All right. Kat, you, you have, um, some experience with uh, uh, unions uh, driving uh, restructurings. Can you, can you highlight that for us? Right, so that's not the typical group that you would think would be driving a restructuring, but um, this case goes back to 2011 and American Airlines in the US. And there's many interesting parts of that case, but the most fascinating from my 
perspective is how the unions drove the restructuring outcome in that case. A uh, bit of background, American Airlines filed Chapter 11. They were working towards a standalone plan. And then along came U.S. Airways. Uh, U.S. Airways negotiated with the unions to cut a better deal with the unions uh, for their pay packages and benefits. Um, if the unions supported U.S. Airways and American Airlines merging in Chapter 11, and it worked. Uh, the three unions also had increased leverage because they were also members of the creditors committee. And um, American Airlines in the end just couldn't afford to fight US Airways off in the chapter 11, so they merged. Um, what are the big takeaways? Well, what you need to consider all of your creditor groups and leverage they hold, because I think many people were surprised by this, um, what was a hostile takeover in chapter 11. And two, hostile takeovers can happen uh, sometimes in bankruptcy proceedings. And given the COVID market right now, this could become an issue as airlines struggle to recover with standalone plans. Thanks, Kat. Uh, just still on the, the creditor point, I thought I'd throw it back to Luke. Uh, COVID-19 has presented uh, us with a unique scenario, pre presented all industries, uh, but uh, in particular the airline industry uh, with a uni unique scenario. How are the creditors responding to this? So I think, I think um, you know, uh, it, it goes back a little bit to the dynamic I was talking about that, you know, financial creditors, I think, are, um, are happy to try to pursue their remedies. I think it's also an interesting dynamic um, where you have a cross-border issue, and you may have some creditors who think they're they're outside of the jurisdiction of the of the country who is hosting the insolvency proceeding, and there's not a clear recognition angle. Um, I think those creditors, particularly if they're not industry creditors, are are very um, focused on exercising their remedies, setting off against collateral, limiting their exposure going forward. I think industry creditors um, realize that that everyone's in this together and that it's going to be an exercise of shared pain and uh, joint cooperation to try to get back to, to get through this period, to get back to the, the levels of uh, passenger demand and uh, ability to fly that, that, that we had historically. Thank you, Luke. Um, Christian, uh, now the question that everyone has been waiting for, uh, from the, the customer side, how do you get your money back after purchasing a, a ticket and airline, an airline enters insolvency proceedings? Uh, I think it's a typical lawyer's answer, it depends. <laughs> So, so I think the best technical uh, thing, bottom line, is um, hope you have paid it by credit card and uh, have got the right credit card company uh, to have paid the ticket. No, but it's it's really dependent on on where you bought it, how you bought it, and what you actually bought. So, um, uh, an online sale directly at the airline will leave you in case of an insolvency with a claim you need to file ultimately. Um, if you have bought it via a ticket agent um, and you've bought uh, something <clears throat> or a rent car or anything in addition, um, you will be covered um, by regulations. So they would need to pay you the money back, which uh, of course is a big issue. We've seen that a lot during COVID. Uh, so that was not the insolvency side, it was more the cancellation piece that uh, they then came up and even the airlines came up, although they were obliged to, um, and offered vouchers instead of repayment or they simply delayed the repayment because they were running out of cash. So, so that's been an ongoing issue. But if you have bought it by an agent, um, uh, you will get it reimbursed, hopefully if the agent does not get bust as well, of course. Um, IATA uh, and the IATA settlement systems provide for a couple of security behind that, but this is not correct if you have uh, done direct booking, especially via the internet. And then you've got the third piece, which of course is uh, credit card providers, as, as a lot of these transactions will be done. And some of them, especially large American one, offer very good chargeback rules. So they're very consumer friendly in doing that. So, so they, will, they will simply take care of that for you and you'll get your money back. So if you think you want to buy cheap uh, 
and you want to buy direct, then at least pay it with the right credit card and look into your terms and conditions before. Adam, I hope that's that's at least a piece of the. <laughs> Very, very helpful, Christian. Uh, John, do you have anything to add to that? And also, um, yeah. what are some of the other issues that uh, you're seeing right now? Yeah, so uh, the, the refunds and, and vouchers question has been an incredibly hot topic um, for the industry over the past few months. Um, I can't sit here and pretend to tell everyone that the airlines are all paying refunds, you know, as timely as they were uh, pre-COVID. Um, I'm sure almost everyone on the call has probably experienced that that's not the case. Uh, if you if you look back to the slides, um, you know, we, we've already seen a $60, a 60 million, 60 billion with a B, it gets bigger and bigger, 60 billion with a B uh, dollar cash burn uh, without paying this huge number of vouchers uh, and uh, of refunds. And simply put, the the systems that the airlines have in place for this process was not intended to address this sort of scenario, right? Um, not just from the financial standpoint of having to all of a sudden uh, reverse months and months worth of ticket sales that they have been using as operating cash, uh, but even just the, the fundamentals of does your online system cope with the volume of refund requests that all of a sudden you're getting that they've never had to deal with before? Uh, do you have the staff on hand to deal with that, even, you know, especially given the, the furloughs and the retrenchments and, and all of the other actions that we've had to take uh, as an industry, well, all industries really, uh, given COVID and given the situation. Uh, so there's this massive glut of refund requests that even if everyone has the greatest intention of, of dealing with them and even happens to have a bunch of cash sitting around that they can pay them, uh, practically speaking, it's, it's really hard to chew through all of that. Uh, so you have seen a lot of the airlines going to vouchers uh, as, a, as an alternative to that. Um, it, can, it can be a, a really good uh, option for some passengers if it's a trip you know you're going to take and it's getting uh, and you're just rescheduling it or if you if you travel a lot for business and so you, you know that you're going to be in the air again then it, it's not the same amount of pain as if it's a maybe a personal ticket that you fly once a year uh, to see your family um, and so we've seen a lot of countries uh, that have been okay with this uh, even explicitly allowing vouchers in lieu of refunds uh, Canada Brazil Mexico Colombia Malaysia, Australia, Turkey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The big two gaps there, which I'm sure everyone knows, is the US and the EU, uh, which are obviously big markets uh, from a, a refund standpoint. Um, both of those jurisdictions, despite, I, I should say, uh, advocacy from IATA, have not been willing to accept vouchers in lieu of refunds unless the customer agrees. So the airline can ask and the customer can agree, uh, but ultimately, if the customer sticks to their guns and says, no, we, I want a refund, uh, then you need to do it. The question then becomes, how, how does that get enforced? Because a lot of the countries in the EU, for example, are kind of ignoring that requirement right now. Uh, if airlines aren't immediately refunding, they're not really getting prosecuted uh, or, or chased up even by the, the local governments. And the EU itself is now looking at, uh, at proceedings against those governments to try to force the governments to enforce uh, the rules on refunds. Um, I, I do think that we are, we are, I mean, at least within IATA's settlement systems, which we have visibility on, we are starting to see the refund volume pick back up as things uh, start to restart at least a little bit on the operation side and as uh, the airlines get their arms around this whole problem of <laughs> how do you deal with this massive glut of requests. Um, so they are making progress and I guess I would say it, you know, if, if you're an individual who's trying to get your your uh, ticket refunded first, and I say this as uh, an industry representative, consider a voucher. <laughs> consider <laughs> postponing your, your trip because, you know, ultimately we're going to need bodies on the plane, as I showed in, in one of our slides. And, and so obviously that's what everyone prefers uh, from an industry standpoint is to keep people flying. Uh, but if you really do re need a refund, I'd say stick to your guns. Um, it can be difficult to get through the airline sometimes, but it, I, we think it is improving from what we can see. Um, and depending on what country you sit, you may or, or may not have a right to enforce that. Uh, but it, it can be a challenge. And, and I, I think maybe one just very brief thing I might throw on top of what Christian said. He, he did a, a very uh, comprehensive way, list of, of possible options to, to get refunds. One other thing to possibly consider 
uh, in the future, in addition to buying on credit cards, et cetera, is uh, some travel insurance uh, will cover this type of situation. Uh, I think COVID, you, you will probably see <laughs> some disputes about that. And so that may not be a, a certain thing, but uh, there are at least for insolvency protections, there are some travel insurances that will cover airline insolvency as well. Uh, so that's something that we've, you know, advocated a lot for is, is customer education as to what the op options are out there when you first buy your ticket. Uh, because even, the, you know, the, the real problem, even worse than a refund, which I, I don't mean to diminish, you know, if, if you're, I'm a, I've got a family of four. And so I can tell you for me, about buying four tickets back to the US, that gets pretty quickly, uh, pretty expensive, pretty quickly. And obviously with things the way they are, refunds and getting that money back into the, into your, personal account is important, but even worse can be repatriation, right? So if you're, if you're stuck abroad and an airline goes under, getting back home, it, it, that's, that's an even worse risk. Uh, and, and so that, that's something that we've been focusing a lot on um, in our advocacy with the governments is not only this, this question of refunds, which is very important, but also making sure that there, there is and there are uh, mechanisms in place to help people get home, especially when an airline can't operate uh, because if, as I said before, the airline itself is the best way to get people home, but sometimes you need a, a backup plan. Thanks, John. I, I um, will now transition to the Q&A section and, and I expect that this question will be for you. Uh, what are your expectations on, on prices after the restart? <laughs> Uh, I can give you John's expectations on prices. Um, obviously, uh, <laughs> IATA as an industry body um, has to be a little careful what we say about prices. Um, but let me give you some at least broad strokes uh, comments. I think, and this, uh, it, you've seen probably a lot of people predicting this in the press as well. So I don't think I'm saying anything really controversial. But I think a lot of people are expecting that there will be a short term dip in prices. Uh, decrease in prices in order to get people on planes, comfortable with the idea of flying, uh, to maybe overcome some of the, the fear of flying with masks on and all, all of that sort of thing. But longer term, again, at least me personally, I, I think th there's going to be a real challenge in trying to keep those low prices or even prices as they were before COVID uh, because of these issues that we've highlighted with the cash flow, uh, with social distancing, with the, even the, the throughput at airports. If you've got, you know, we, we talked a little bit about social distancing on a plane, but we haven't mentioned social distancing in an airport. If you have to keep your distance in security, for example, I mean, anyone who's ever gone through uh, the security at one of the U.S. airports, it's, it's bad enough as it was. Now, stretch that line out where everybody's got two meters or six feet in between them, uh, you know, and the line will be out the building. Um, so, so there will be a lot of pressure on on the margins, which even at the, at the best of times, we're not we're not a high margin industry. Uh, I think there's a, a stat that we used to quote that the average uh, margin on a on a ticket is less than a price of a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Um, so, with all of these challenges, I, I fear that at least medium term, the prices may have to come up a little bit so that the the price of operating can be offset a little bit. Uh, but it, it'll, it'll definitely be a space for airlines to differentiate themselves. So I, I think you may see certain model airlines taking different approaches and probably yelling about it in the press. If they, if they can keep their fares low, that'll, that'll be a, a big draw for them, obviously. Thanks, John. Luke, uh, this uh, next question is for you, but to anyone can uh, feel free to step in. Uh, in a Chapter 11 case of a foreign airline, which has the Comey uh, not in the U.S., would a U.S. court respect the choice of insolvency law under Cape Town, under the Cape Town Convention, made by the contracting state of the debtor seat? And uh, uh, that is what is provided for by Article 30, sub 4 of uh, Cape Town Convention's aircraft protocol, and the U.S. is a contracting state. That sounds a lot like an active issue I have right now in a case, so I'm going <laughs> to demur. I will move on to the next question. Uh, Kat, uh, can you explain uh, why the super scheme is not considered an insolvency proceeding under the Cape Town Convention? Right, so this is controversial. Um, 
and as uh, Jeffrey Wool has pointed out, it's um, it's it's been con it it has been controversial for a long time whether or not a scheme is an insolvency proceeding, and I think most Europeans you know, kind of chuckle a bit when they hear that it's not an insolvency proceeding. Um, it's not technically an insolvency proceeding. Um, the scheme of arrangement is done under uh, Part 26 of the Companies Act of 2006, and it's an adjustment. Um, it's a corporate proceeding. Uh, there is an entire Insolvency Act of uh, 1986 of the, in the UK, and this is not one of the procedures under them. So technically, it is not um, the regular scheme as we knew at Part 26 was was not an insolvency proceeding in the U.S. Uh, under Chapter 15 and in other places that have recognized schemes sort of as and what it quotes insolvency proceedings um, is because they've been so close to an, an insolvency and restructuring proceeding that they they're you know for the for the purpose of restructuring uh, certain. Um, schemes have been recognized under under chapter 15. Um, part 26a is the super scheme and it's under the same part of the companies it's it's right underneath part part 26 so it's, it's the same act the companies act it's not in the insolvency act and and so that's where the argument does come from that it's not an insolvency proceeding um, I, I think this is going to be a live issue uh, and I don't know how it will come out. So I think there are really good arguments on both sides um, and we'll, we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, if, if I can add on to it, I think it'll be interesting to see from the passenger <laughs> standpoint, regardless of whether it's technically an insolvency proceeding for those purposes, how and whether this is viewed by the public as different from you know, a, a chapter 11 or a restructuring in other countries, uh, because we can see, you know, from where we sit with the, looking at the, the refunds that are coming through our systems and, and the, the communications we get from travel agents, there's a certain level of security, I guess, with a chapter 11. People know what that is. Um, and it's not as scary, perhaps, as if someone says, okay, we filed bankruptcy under country X's law that no one's really familiar with, even if as a practical matter, that really is very similar to chapter 11, it can still have a bigger PR hit than perhaps chapter 11 does just because people don't know what it is. I, I think that's a totally fair point, John. I think that's particularly true in a lot of jurisdictions where they don't have a non liquidating restructuring regime where the word bankruptcy means ceasing operations means customers can't rely means ceasing flying. Um, and uh, you know, uh, we we always try to refer to Chapter 11 as as a reorganization proceeding uh, when we can, and not a bankruptcy proceeding for that reason, because it has a lot of local connotations. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we are uh, getting into a, a spirited uh, debate, and and one that could perhaps uh, we're also running uh, out of time. So perhaps it's something that uh, can be continued offline. Um, and uh, for now, I think um, we will close out. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone for attending this webinar today and a special thank you to the panelists for their extremely hard work in uh, putting together this webinar. Um, I will now turn uh, the proceedings over to Ivan Romo who will give uh, his final comments and uh, we'll close out the webinar. Thanks, Adam. Uh, it has been a great uh, webinar, guys. It was very interesting, and it looks we are facing a complex uh, scenario still ahead. So we are looking forward to hear you again in August. Uh, on behalf of the Next Gen program, the Triple I, uh, I want to thank you, all the panelists and all the participants. Uh, we will see you again soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.